Good evening, and welcome to Third Church. We're so glad to have you here with us. Each one of you adds to the richness of this healing service. Let's start by singing hymn number 340. I'll read the first verse. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. Hymn number 340. I'll read from the Bible and correlative passages from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. First, the Bible. Exodus. And God spake all these words, saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Mark. The first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is but one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Luke, but I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful.
and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water, water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. John, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. If ye love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. First John, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. John, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. First John, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Romans, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore Love is the fulfilling of the law. John, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Psalms, remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, 
for they have been ever of old. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Romans. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Philippians. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Second Corinthians, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. and from the science and health. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 20, 3. The first commandment is my favorite text. It demonstrates Christian science. The divine principle of the first commandment bases the science of being by which man demonstrates health, holiness, and life eternal. Jesus' teaching and practice of truth involved such a sacrifice as makes us admit its principle to be love. His proof of Christianity was no form or system of religion and worship, but Christian science, working out the harmony of life and love. Our church is built on the divine principle, love, we can unite with this church only as we are newborn of spirit, as we reach the life which is truth and the truth which is life by bringing forth the fruits of love, casting out error and healing the sick. Jesus aided in reconciling man to God by giving man a truer sense of love the divine principle of Jesus' teachings. And this truer sense of love redeems man from the law of matter, sin, and death by the law of spirit, the law of divine love. It is related in the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel that Jesus was once the honored guest of a certain Pharisee by name Simon, though he was quite unlike Simon the disciple. While they, they were at meat, an unusual incident occurred, as if to interrupt the scene of Oriental festivity. A strange woman came in. Heedless of the fact that she was debarred from such a place and such society, especially under the stern rules of rabbinical law, as positively as if she were a Hindu pariah intruding on the household of a high-caste Brahmin. This woman... Mary Magdalene, as she has since been called, approached Jesus. According to the custom of those days, he reclined on a couch with his head towards the table and his bare feet away from it. 
It was therefore easy for the Magdalene to come behind the couch and reach his feet. She bore an alabaster jar containing costly and fragrant oil, sandal oil perhaps, which is in such common use in the East. Breaking the sealed jar, she perfumed Jesus' feet with the oil, wiping them with her long hair which hung loosely about her shoulders, as was customary with women of her grade. Did Jesus spurn the woman? Did he repel her adoration? No, he regarded her compassionately. Nor was this all. Knowing that those around him, knowing what those around him were saying in their hearts, especially his host, that they were wondering why, being a prophet, the exalted guest did not at once detect the woman's immoral status and bid her depart, Knowing this, Jesus rebuked them with a short story or parable. He described two debtors, one for a large sum and one for a smaller, who were released from their obligations by their common creditor. Which of them will love him most, was the master's question to Simon the Pharisee. And Simon replied, he to whom he forgave most. Jesus approved the answer and so brought home the lesson to all, following it with that remarkable declaration to the woman, thy sins are forgiven. Why did he thus summarize her debt to divine love? Her reverence was unfeigned, and it was manifested towards one who was soon, though they knew it not, to lay down his mortal existence in behalf of all sinners, that through his word and works they might be redeemed from sensuality and sin. Which was the higher tribute to such ineffable affection, the hospitality of the Pharisee or the contrition of the Magdalene? This query Jesus answered by rebuking self-righteousness and declaring the absolution of the penitent if Christian scientists are like Simon, then it must be said of them also that they love little. On the other hand, do they show their regard for truth or Christ by their genuine repentance, by their broken hearts expressed by meekness and human affection, as did this woman? If so, then it may be said of them, as Jesus said of the unwelcome visitor, that they indeed love much because much is forgiven them. What we most need is the prayer of fervent desire for growth in grace, expressed in patience, meekness, love, and good deeds. To keep the commandments of our master and follow his example is our proper debt to him and the only worthy evidence of our gratitude for all that he has done. Outward worship is not of itself sufficient to express loyal and heartfelt gratitude, since he has said, if he loved me, keep my commandments. Some individuals assimilate truth more readily than others, but any student who adheres to the divine rules of Christian science and imbibes the spirit of Christ, can demonstrate Christian science, cast out error, heal the sick, and add continually to his store of spiritual understanding, potency, enlightenment, and success. The test of all prayer lies in the answer to these questions. Do we love our neighbor better because of this asking? If selfishness has given place to kindness, we shall regard our neighbor unselfishly and bless them that curse us. But we, we shall never meet this great duty simply by asking that it may be done. There is a cross to be taken up before we can enjoy the fruition of our hope and faith. Dost thou love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind? This command includes much, even the surrender of all merely sens 
of all merely material sensation, affection, and worship. This is the El Dorado of Christianity. It involves the science of life and recognizes only the divine control of spirit in which soul is our master and material sense and human will have no place. We must go and do likewise, else we are not improving the great blessings which our master worked and suffered to bestow upon us. First in the list of Christian duties, he taught his followers the healing power of truth and love. Our master said to every follower, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Heal the sick, love thy neighbor as thyself. He that touches the hem of Christ's robe and masters his mortal beliefs, animality and hate, rejoices in the proof of healing in a sweet and certain sense that God is love. The vital part, the heart and soul of Christian science is love. Love enriches the nature, enlarging, purifying, and elevating it. Become conscious for a single moment that life and intelligence are purely spiritual, neither in nor of matter, and the body will then utter no complaints. If suffering from a belief in sickness, you will find yourself suddenly well. Sorrow is turned into joy when the body is controlled by spiritual life, truth, and love. Love will finally mark the hour of harmony, and spiritualization will follow, for love is spirit. Spiritually, to understand that there is but one creator, God, unfolds all creation, confers the script, confirms the scripture, brings the sweet assurance of no parting, no pain, and of man, deathless and perfect and eternal. Each su successive stage of experience unfolds new views of divine goodness and love. Let's pray for the congregation, first silently, then repeat together the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Let's sing hymn number 124. How gentle God's commands, how kind his precepts are. Come, cast your burdens on the Lord and trust his constant care. Hymn number 124. This church is a branch of the Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. We hold Sunday services at 11 a.m. and Wednesday testimony meetings at 7.30 p.m. We also have services in Spanish, Sundays at 1 p.m. and Wednesdays at 5.30 p.m. All services will be held online and in person for up to 10 people until further notice. We are following social distancing recommendations and encourage wearing a mask. For more information, please visit our website, thirdchurchnyc.com. We hope you will join us. Christian science is practical and it heals. Our meeting is now open for all to share experiences of healing and spiritual insights that prove God's ever presence and power in their lives. If you would like to share and are listening by telephone, press star nine and wait till your line is unmuted. If you're watching via Zoom, you can choose the raise your hand icon or unmute yourself to speak. And if you're here present, feel free to speak at any moment, either standing up or sitting down. Thank you for your readings. I. Um I've been thinking about the first commandment uh, ever since our lesson on Adam and fallen man, where uh, science and health makes um, a very clear cut distinction between uh, the first chapter and the second chapter. Uh, the first chapter would indicate one God, one creator, and uh, that's where the first commandment kind of comes in. The second chapter is obviously a breaking of the commandment. Um, I don't know if Genesis was written before Exodus or not, but within the Christian tradition, Exodus comes afterwards and the Ten Commandments uh, come there. Um, the first, in the beginning, is trans, in Latin is in principio. Um, Principio uh, is the base word for our word principle. And it breaks down into two Latin words, prim, first, cipio, sees, 
So principal is the first to seize. And I know that my Christian science teacher uh, frequently uh, brought that up in class and in lectures and uh, in associations. Um, and she kind of coined the term, principal got there first. No matter what we were dealing with, uh, something current, something longstanding, something from early life, uh, principal got there first. In the glossary of science and health, Mrs. Eddy, I just discovered um, a couple of days ago, defines um, ungodliness as the opposition to principle and its uh, spiritual idea. That obviously is what the Garden of Eden, uh, the story of Garden of Eden tells us. Uh, the snake says, ye shall be as gods, uh, meaning that, that the one God is, is either ignored or certainly put into the periphery. Um, this week we read about the Tower of Babel in which uh, men are building to become gods. Um, the Revised Standard Version uh, says so that they can make a name for themselves, uh, which I think is good. Uh, the King James just says to make a name. Um, that kind of disobedience to principle or the first commandment is something that gets in the way of Christian science demonstration uh, in which God is all in all and eternal and infinite and omnipotent. Uh, and we can go on and on with, with those qualities and elements of divine being. Um, so I've been very interested in uh, thinking about and demonstrating somewhat more consistently uh, the first commandment um, for those of you who like to read articles, Jill Gooding, teacher from London and a lecturer in 1990 or 91 uh, uh, in a journal, wrote an article on the, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, spiritualizing them all. And I looked at that, I think, a couple of weeks ago for the first time in many years, and it really is a very helpful article about that. So anyway, thank you for your reading. Thank you. I'd like to share a healing I had recently. Um, about a week ago, I started to have some pain in my lower back, <clears throat> such that it was hard to sit down, stand, it's hard to move, it's hard to be comfortable in any position. And um, my first thought was, oh, you're just getting old, and you have old bones, and you're gonna have to deal with old age, and that's too hard to, to heal. And the minute I said that, I thought, oh, don't talk to you, don't talk about yourself like that. And I remembered about 15 years ago, I had a very similar problem. And I didn't say anything like that. I immediately started to pray. And I, I prayed for a couple weeks and I had practitioners working with me. Um, and I, I don't even remember the prayers, but I, I had the opportunity to study and grow and learn more about my relation to God, and within a couple of weeks, um, the pain ceased and my back became normal again. I was able to move comfortably. Um, and it, just this realization that I'm trying to blame this pain, which was just a belief to begin with, on another belief that's too hard, it's like almost like adding up a whole row of zeros. And some of those zeros are really, really big zeros. And when you add them all up at the end, you come up with another zero. Um, beliefs are just beliefs. And, and the truth can help us overcome these beliefs and replace them with the truth of our, our perfect nature, our health, our stability, and our closeness to God. And um, it was just today that I noticed that the sharp pain when I moved and my back was gone. Um, it was reaching into the truth that I had proved before, reaching into the truth about who I am, about who we all are, and about this belief that with 
advanced years, we act in certain ways, which is just a belief and can be handled just as, as surely as anything else. And it was, and I'm, I'm so grateful. readings from the desk tonight. I, I appreciate the, the prayer that goes into the preparation of the readings, and I'm very grateful that the subject of the, uh, the readings is clear. Um, in this time I was, uh, of being uh, uh, sheltered at home, uh, it's, it was very pleasant that the church was able to have uh, a service where 10 people were allowed to uh, be there in person. It was uh, really a, a cause for celebration. And I'm very gr uh, grateful for the uh, readers that have uh, maintained the online presence during this uh, period of sheltering in place. Um, I appreciate also that all the people in obeying the guidelines that the uh, state has set forth uh, have uh, been efficacious, have been effective in uh, getting, uh, achieving the objective of reducing the, the incidence of people that are uh, suffering from uh, this COVID virus. I know that it's, it's a belief and that we, uh, we can't give uh, a law to, uh, to, mater to matter and to uh, beliefs of the absence of God, that our prayer has to take any situation that would uh, uh, deny the presence and power uh, of God and the unity of man with God. And that's, that's where prayer starts. And it challenges us all to uh, pray actively that God leads us if we turn to God for learning how to pray, uh, that those prayers are always answered. Um, and I'm grateful for the progress and, uh, and know that, the man that God's manifestation in our lives is always happening. Um, I'm grateful for the unfoldment of ideas. It's very clear to me that every moment, every day is like a piece of art to be, to be um, crafted and uh, painted and, and uh, brought forth uh, with care and uh, to, to seize every moment and to make it as uh, a, an expression of good, an expression of love, as can as can be, and it's uh, it's a re very rewarding. And and as uh, I turn to God for guidance, and uh, and the the rapidity with which ideas come forth and challenges that need to be met. Uh, Encountered is, is something to behold. And I'm very grateful for the, um, the teachings of Christian science and its beneficent effect on my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimonies remarks, and prayerful presence during this service. Let's conclude by singing hymn number 401. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, Hear us, we humbly pray. And where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Hymn number 401. <laughs> 